again, welcome everybody who came to Artist Power Photography um, series that SCOE's been putting on for the Solano County youth. Um, so excited that you're here. Um, so I know three of you know who I am, but the rest of you might not know me. Uh, my name is Nadja Fitchhorn, and I'm not going to read the slide verbatim. I'm just going to kind of give you a brief overview because all of that is blah, 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 blah. And you can read it later. Um, I'm more about talking from the heart and from, from saying what's, you know, put on my spirit to say and, and just kind of going au naturel. And so in this case, um, I teach photography, graphic design one, and graphic design two at Buckingham. I used to teach your book. And um, I am also an advisor to the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising uh, Fashion Design Club, um, of whom we have one solid member here, someone who just applied to fit them. And so those that's all my formal information. Um, as far as before we get going, I wanted to put this out there for everyone that's here. Um, this is all the formal information about me. This is something you could read. Literally, I copied and pasted it off my LinkedIn profile. Um, but what I really need you all to know about me is um, that one, this is a safe place to talk about things if you feel compelled to. And it's also um, a place where we're gonna be um, really real. I, I know a lot of times when teachers and adults are talking to youth, um, there tends to be a wall and it, and there's a lot of subject matters that aren't talked about between teachers and students. There's, there's just this formality. And for me to be an adult to tell you, I understand, or, Oh, it's going to be okay. Oh, you know, everything's going to be fine. A lot of times that sounds like just something that, you know, Oh, they're just saying that just because they have to. Um, but I'm coming from a place of realness and I, you can trust me with your information and to build that trust. I want to give you some information about me. Um, I like being transparent about who I am with my students and any of the three students that are here right now on this zoom with us will tell you I'm absolutely real. So I have to tell you that I have been where you might have possibly been. I, I, I connect with students because I remember what it's like to be depressed. I used to um, have a struggle with depression, serious depression when I was in high school. I was a cutter. Um, I've suffered eating disorders. I have ADD and um, also borderline personality disorder. So when I'm here, I'm 2000% up here. And when I'm down, I'm 2000% in the negative. So having to cope with a lot of those situations, I can authentically say one of the connecting threads that was my therapy, that was my go-to, that was my way to get out the pain and what I what I couldn't say sometimes or what that was too overwhelming to say was I used my art. Now, I'm not just a photographer. I enjoy painting and drawing as well. Um, so there's a lot of different ways in which I express um, those things, but um, I'm really hoping that if not this series, there's in, in this whole series, if not the medium of photography, um, then maybe another medium, you will find a way for you to say things that you can't say. Now on that note, go to the next slide, just so you can see a tiny bit of my work. I didn't want to, I don't want to make this about me. I wanted this to be about you and about some technical inspirational things. The students who are guest speaking about techniques and, and, and ways to be inspired. But just so you know, here's some of my work. I travel extensively and I love doing travel photography. Um, in my other life, I'm a, a travel blogger, I guess. And so um, there's that. And then um, one of my guilty pleasures, uh, yes, I do portraiture. Yes, I do like senior sessions. Um, yes, I like to do a lot of Instagram and lifestyle shots, but one of my guilty pleasures, I'm sorry, I know this is probably petty, but I get thrilled when people like my posts on Instagram. So like, for instance, if I took pictures up here of Mac in San Francisco, which is an amazing Mac and cheese restaurant, they liked my images. And this was taken in Amsterdam. The Amsterdam Muse uh, Library um, liked my stuff. The Museum of Ice Cream, the founder, uh, he liked my photo. You know, this cafe shared mine um, in England. This one was taken of a museum called the serpentine gallery they liked my image and then this one i didn't take but it's i love if anyone's heard of english beat it's a ska band from the 80s i really really love it's a picture of me with ranking roger and the english beat actually like this image so it's it's a guilty pleasure i know it's petty i know it's small but um it's just something that i enjoy and 
so that you can see where photography can allow you to express things that maybe you can't say or that you've been afraid to say, here are some photos that these students all gave me permission to share, their previous students. Um, the student on the left had used, um, she suffered from eating disorders. And in this emotions project that I give my high school students, they are told that they have to portray either themselves or someone else, either literally or abstractly, coping with some sort of an emotion. And I never know what I'm gonna get. And these students always, it never ceases to amaze me, the fearlessness and how, and also how safe they must feel to be able to portray some of these things. So the um, student on the left used her images um, as a way to remind her of like, she, she was fighting. If she could admit she had an eating disorder, she was in the process of succeeding battling and, and overcoming it. Um, the student in the middle was diagnosed with type one di diabetes and her every minute was filled with taking her blood sugar and, you know, a very deadly disease. Um, any miscalculation of carbohydrates could kill her. So she felt like her life was dictated by um, her insulin and her needles and testing. And then the image on the right, another student took, um, and these were two students that were not only struggling with um, identity um, as far as uh, gender, but sexuality and being not being able to um, come out who they authentically were, um, you know, because we never know some of us we are in safe places to be who we are and some of us aren't, whether it's family or culture. And so they use their photos to represent something that they might not be talking about on the other side of school. Um, and again, as a teacher, I'm, I'm a safe space classroom. And so, um, you know, I, I definitely protect my students and, and allow them to have this voice. Um, and I'm so proud of them when they do. So I'm not going to talk in, in a lot of detail about these, but you can decide for yourself as I go through them. I'm just going to go through about four slides of student examples that I've been collecting over the last couple of years in which you as the viewer, like one of you might think one thing like this emotion is fear and another person might think it's this or that. And that's what's amazing about art is that it's a conversation between the creator and the viewer and it can be a different conversation and sometimes you guys sometimes you'll make a piece of art that nobody understands but you and that is okay that doesn't matter all that matters is that you felt like you needed to produce it and you got it out there and and you found joy in doing that that's all that matters but i can guarantee you there was always one person who will connect with your work there's always someone else out there who will see something and go that touched me, like that really connected with me. Um, so you can see very powerful images. Again, these are all student pieces of work. And sometimes some of the images really are hard for me to look at because I'm wondering what are they thinking? Most students feel safe telling me. Um, some students I'll never know. And not all emotions have to be like you know, emotions that are like negative and take away that energy, but some could be positive. Like this is an image of maybe determination or tenacity or strength, right? Um, but my goodness, I'm not quite sure why Shannon's image didn't show up on because it was here earlier. I saw it. You saw it. Yeah, here. I saw it. I saw it. Okay, so I'm not sure what's going on here, but it was here earlier when we were all practicing. Um, so Shannon, you will meet and you'll see her image hopefully in the next couple of slides. We have three student speakers here um, that I... Um, have had the pleasure of teaching and creating connection with. On the left is um, Shannon Galera, and she's a current student who plans to attend design school this fall. Um, her Instagram is here. You can see some of her photography work. She shoots professionally high school senior sessions and also artistically. Um, Arcadia graduated with me in 2017 and she is attending photography school this fall in Sacramento. And um, she and I also connected over photography through yearbook, but then eventually she ended up taking um, another one of my courses and um, 
I'll let her tell that story. And then Gary is also a current student, um, a MUA makeup artist and a dancer, um, going to fit him this fall, but she and I, she's she's had a couple of different classes with me, but she found photography to be a medium to be her voice when she didn't have a voice. And I'll let each one of them tell their stories, but she, as a nail, soon to be nail tech, taking one, Gary, when are you taking your test? Um, in April. In April, yeah. So Gary is, Gary used her time wisely over COVID and quarantine to teach herself how to be a nail tech. And so she's taking the official um, cosmetology um, test soon, but she's also a makeup artist um, and stylist and dancer. But you'll hear a little bit more in a second. There's Shannon. I don't know what, no, I, I just appeared. I know, that's so weird. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start with Shannon. You can read a little bit more of her bio. Um, you know, like I said, we're gonna share the slideshow with you afterwards, but I want to hear her talk because I could talk about all their work nonstop from my perspective, but I'm gonna let her run through some of her work and expand on what she feels are the most important pieces and why. And can I give um, Shannon, or Shannon, just tell me when to go to the next slide. I'll, yeah, I'll... I can totally do that. Okay. All right, so hi guys, I'm Shannon Galera, but some people know me as Shannon Rowe. I'm a senior at BCCA this year, and I'm here to talk to you guys about my journey with art and my journey with photography, where that's gotten me and where I plan to go with it. You can find me at ch3nin.rwe on Instagram or at my website, www.shannonrowe.com. Anyway, so here's a couple of my first moments. So I actually started delving deep into photography when I was in sixth grade, so middle school. And during that time, we had a digital photography class at my middle school, and that's where I kind of learned camera basics and a little bit of Photoshop. But during that time, I really only did still life, which are the pictures to the right. You can see it, the bicycle and, you know, the cherry blossom. But um, it wasn't until I got into my sophomore year that I had a little bit of a photography revival. And that's where I kind of started getting into por portraiture, photo manipulation, and... Um, that's when I really started to take it really seriously. All right, next slide. So here's one memorable moment of mine. Um, I took it during Ms. Fitchwang's class uh, my sophomore year, and it was part of my emotions project. It's called The Shadow in the Valley. And as you can see, you know, I, I was really proud of the picture at the time. I thought it really conveyed emotion, a deeper meaning. I thought the value range was really awesome. So that's that one. Next slide. Okay, so last August, I actually started to taking client commissions. And the reason why was because a lot of people had already known that I did photography and a lot of people started to really realize that, you know, there was some potential with this. So they wanted me to take their senior pictures for them. And I was like, I'll just start charging. So <laughs> that's kind of the reason why. <laughs> but the other part of that was because I really like to take pictures of people. And I started to realize that my sophomore year, like I said, um, there's something about being able to capture someone in a beautiful way or in a beautiful moment. And it really boosts their self-esteem and you really feel good about it because they're able to really see themselves in a beautiful way. And I think, you know, if you're able to do that, that's a job well done. Uh, next slide. Here's a couple more of my pictures. Okay. I've been all over for um, some of the senior sessions that I do, like some local places like Pena Adobe and Vacaville, but also some places like Marin County. Um, the bottom right picture was taken in Marin County, uh, all over San Francisco, the Golden Gate Bridge, Dillon Beach, all kinds of places. So yeah, as a photographer, you get to travel a lot, see new places, and you once you really start to develop your eye, you can see um, spots that would be good for photography literally anywhere. So Next true. slide. All right, so something that I've been learning how to do is to develop a personal style. And I think working with a lot of clients, a lot of people just want their pictures to look different or a certain way. And you kind of, as the photographer, have to adhere to that because it's what the client wants. But sometimes you can get caught up in doing what other people want and not exactly what you want to do as a photographer. So it's really important that if you get into photography, you really start to develop your own style over time. Make sure it's something recognizable, it's unique, something that people can see and know exactly who took it. Next slide. And then 
um, as I kind of wrap up here, expression is also another thing that I learned as an artist. And I didn't learn this until I started getting in touch with other artists, getting really close with a lot of uh, uh, people who were into fine art, visual art. People began to tell me like, hey, you know, you can really use this medium to express yourself, come to understand yourself. And I really took that to heart, especially as someone who's part of the LGBTQ plus community. I really like to express um, my experience, my identity. And even if it's just something fun that you want to express, like something to the left, which is my senior picture, um, it's a really great way to kind of capture that stuff. Or if you want to capture something that's more serious, like the pictures to the right, where, you know, there's more of a solemn attitude to it. Whatever it is, you can really express yourself through photography. Um, the next slide. And here's a little bit more of my fine artwork. This collection specifically is called Hometown, and it's taken with a film camera, but there's not a lot going on in these pictures, but what I can say is they're supposed to capture the documentation that can come with photography. Even if you're not using photography to convey a theme or a message that's very specific, it's a really great way to, you know, journal what's going on in your day. You know, capture moments that you want to look back on and remember. I know that for these pictures, they meant a lot to me. So I wanted to take pictures of these moments, you know, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I think that even if you're not really into, you know, art or saying something about the world with it, taking pictures just to remember is a really great, great way to remember exactly what was going on in the moment. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Okay, so in the future, I actually plan to uh, pursue graphic design and not photography, but photography is a really, really essential tool that designers need to have. I think, you know, a lot of designers want to be able to use other people's images, stock images, but to be able to produce exactly what you need as a graphic designer is very important. Also, um, just if anyone's planning to go into art school, if you're really good with a camera, that's a huge plus because you can add those to your portfolio. And those are a lot of um, art schools, like more art school, visual art schools that are into like fine art stuff. They're looking for pieces that actually have some meaning in mind and not just, you know, something that's like branding oriented. So those uh, pictures that I took were actually really good portfolio fillers. So I definitely recommend, you know, getting good with a camera and adding them to your portfolio. That's great. And then here's a little bit more of my work, some advertisements that I did for myself. Uh, this just demonstrating how you can use your images with your, you know, graphic design or if you're into like painting or uh, collaging, you can use the pictures that you used or that you took in your collage. Mm -hmm. Those are all super, super great points, um, Shannon. And thank you for reminding us about um, thinking of the documentation. You know, the focus for me was about uh, using it as a tool to cope emotionally, but also documenting places that you've been in your life because you want to look back and go, oh my gosh, I remember that good and bad. Like I look back at times in my life and I no longer have that sadness from high school. I actually enjoy looking back and being like, oh, wow. Like, you know, so thank you for that. And, and on that note, now's a good time before we hear from Arcadia. Does anyone here have any questions for Shannon, whether you want to, um, uh, go ahead. I don't know if we can see the chat or do I have to stop sharing for a second, but, um, does anyone have any questions for Shannon before we move on? Um, either in the chat room or you can turn on your mic. Anyone? We'll give it like a couple more seconds just in case, because I know sometimes we're like clicking around trying to find our mute and unmute buttons. No, good. Okay, I'm gonna move on. You can always come back to this later. Um, let's see, I do have, I'm gonna check the chat. So, oh, that's great. Nice, good comments. Thank you um, for that positive feedback. Okay, um, so our next student is Arcadia. And like I said before, um, she graduated in 2017, which is like weird for both of us to think about. Um, and, you know, it's funny because uh, I'll let her talk about our work, but I do have to say that um, Arcadia and I start, I was telling everybody before you all came in, the students came in, um, I was telling the SCOE uh, team here that Arcadia and I, when she first, I was a new teacher. And um, so I learned a lot about being a good teacher from Arcadia um, and we butted heads a lot at first, but, the, but you know what? Um, 
I learned that being a teacher is not just about like making all the kids mind and do exactly what I want them to do, exactly how I want to do it. And, you know, because then you think as a teacher, you're supposed to be this person that has absolute control and, you know, all the students are going to do exactly what you want them to. But when I went, the moment that I saw Arcadia as Arcadia and not just student XYZ to like control and put into a box. As soon as I let Arcadia be Arcadia and I recognized her uh, for who she was and the talents that she had and ones that she, I don't think even knew she had, um, it really changed our relationship. And now obviously, if we're here together th this many years ago and I'm still in touch with her, um, we, we formed a really great bond and, and it was, um, you know, just really, good for both of us. I think a great relationship for both of us, but I'm so proud to say that she's going to be attending um, CNC in Sacramento to pursue a degree in photography. And I will let her tell you about her photos and what they meant to her at certain points in her life. Hi guys. So I'm Arcadia. I had graduated in 2017, as you know. Miss Fitchhorn is basically like my second mom to like photography. She got me into it. But like growing up, it was always kind of like my escape from reality. It helped me get through the hard times in life and obviously capture the good moments like Shane had mentioned. Um, this image specifically, I was kind of going through a lot in life. Um, I'm kind of was depressed. My best friend had committed suicide my junior year. So it was just hard for me to go to school and try to graduate and also figure out what I wanted to do after high school and continue life knowing that someone so close to me had done something that I never thought would happen. Um, I fit geared like something like this picture kind of it tells a story. It's like an empty road, but it also leads to somewhere, but nobody knows where. That's kind of like life. Um, I love personally the trees and how they just crawl out into the sky and everything. It's just, it's kind of my own way of saying, let's get out and capture the good moments in life. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, this picture was my senior sunset. I love the beach. The beach is like my home. It is my escape from reality also with photography. I love being at peace and feeling the sand on my toes, the water, hearing the waves crash. It was also kind of like me and my best friend's own way to get away from everything. And just this picture is just me trying to say, okay, this is like, my turning point, this is my senior sunset, I need to figure out where I'm gonna do, what I'm gonna do. And I kind of use some of the little things that Miss Fitchhorn had teached me in high school, um, with the light, the pictures and everything. So if you wanna go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you, Arcadia. <laughs> <laughs> so jellyfish are my number one favorite animal besides dogs, of course. Um, I think they are beautiful, they're majestic, They not a lot of people see their true beauty. Like they just, they flow, like they're just beautiful. <laughs> um, but, but they can also like hurt you in ways that you don't know how to handle it. They sting you like that's, I kind of feel like that's me in a way. Um, like I have beautiful sides, but then also there's sides of me that people don't really know unless they get to know me. I mean, I hurt people, everyone hurts people, but also everyone, has that beautiful side that you first see in the very first moment. So that's how I connect myself to jellyfish. Well, thank you for being, I'm so glad that you made that connection because I wasn't sure if you were gonna go there like you did with me. I was waiting for you to like explain how you found like a connection and you found relationship between you and jellyfish. And so how like that, that's, I think that's a huge, huge thing when you can connect in that moment. And, and thank you for sharing that because I know it's really super personal and I really appreciate it. Um, so Arcadia, um, anyone questions for Arcadia? And you can again, and chat. I know other people are probably monitoring the chat better than I can. I'm really bad about it. <laughs> um, but if you have any questions, you can either turn off your mic or you can um, put it in the chat. 
and I'm hoping somebody like Joe will monitor it for me. Um, and we'll keep an eye on it for sure. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and move on because I haven't heard from anybody turning on their mics. Um, okay, so this is Gary. And um, so Gary is currently like, um, I think, oh no, I was telling the SCOE team. Um, she is currently a student at Buckingham like Shannon. Shannon's been through all of my my graphic design one, my photo and my graphic design two. But Gary, Gary has taken graphic design one and photography, but Gary's main primary art is, um, she is a dancer with the Bliss Urban Arts Center. And she's actually danced pretty much almost her whole life, but she's also a makeup artist and into the beauty industry and sees herself um, using her design and photography skills to um, further her, um, further her career that way and is applying to fit them and I'm I'm pretty sure she's gonna make it in but she used photography even though her main art is a different form um, photography class allowed her to say something that she at that time in her life couldn't say verbally um, and I will let her tell that part of the story because it's extremely personal and it's pretty deep. Um, I know that, um, you know, Arcadia had talked a little bit about using photography to cope with um, a really, um, sh you know, really stressful situation in her life um, in that first photograph. But I'm gonna let you talk, Gary, about you and f what photography means to you and talk about this photo. All right, so hi everyone, I'm Gary. Thank you, Ms. Fitchhorn, for introducing me. So this is my first time actually speaking about my story personally. I've never shared it to the world before. I've kind of just kept it inside. I'm more of an inside person, so bear with me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've always been into makeup, cosmetology, all that stuff, and photography too, but a different side, more of like um, take pictures of like, I used to do stop motion when I was little, you know, little things like that. So bringing out my emotions at this time period was really different for me, you know? Um, so I'm gonna talk about my person. So I was with this person for a while, you know, we had gained a relationship with each other. We were actually dating and, you know, he was someone who was just so outgoing, you know, really nerdy, just like me, you know, kind of just over like, you know, a happy person, like an excited person, but sometimes people don't see that their own qualities, you know, they don't see you from another person's point of view. And because of that, he had decided to take his own life, which is just something that I've never thought that I'd ever have to deal with in my life, you know, losing someone that close to me before. It's It was scary, you know, of course, you know, going through a grieving process was, just very different for me. I've never thought that I'd have to do that. So, you know, my emotions were just all over the place. And honestly, having this project has changed my life in so many different ways. So, um, I noticed through photography, I would, I'm always capturing my moments, even with him. I have tons of pictures of us just on dates, you know, it was either just the sky or our shoes or the side of his face. And sometimes you can even notice the emotions in someone's face, like if they're overly excited or if they're just not feeling it that day. And that's something that has always stuck with me. You know, I look at the pictures and I'm like, I didn't notice these things and capturing an image is just so beautiful to me because I can look back and I've always had these memories for the rest of my life now, you know. I get to see everything that we were both feeling in an image and just him in general. Um, um, sometimes, you know, I, during my grieving process, I would just shut down, you know, I would, come to school, you know, and just kind of be in my own little bubble. But when I would see Miss Fitzhorn, she would come in with a bright smile. She's like, hey guys, we're gonna be doing this. And it would just make my whole day. It was just like, you know, kind of something, it was an outlet. She was an outlet and photography was a great outlet for me. You know, when we had created the Emotions Project, I knew exactly how I would want to show my way of, art you know so 
when we were together, we would always hold hands, you know, a couple always holds hands, we're always together. And as you can see in the photo, we're holding hands. But this time in the photo, you can see that there's chains. And the chains to me were, um, showed the weight that he was holding, you know. When you're not feeling good about yourself, you hold all this weight on your shoulders, you feel weighed down. And my hand is actually in the photo and I'm grabbing his hand, you know, because for me it was a, I had first named the project Letting Go because it was my time to just let go of everything. I was finally closing the door. But at the same time, it's really hard to not let go you know it's hard to just you know move on or just it's it's a lot of, to feel so he's holding back and i'm just holding on to him as a reason to just hold on to everything and keep all those memories locked in and in the background he was very very close to his mother his mother was someone she was just a pocket of joy, she was always there for him. So I s simply just put a picture of him and his mother to show, and it adds that extra emotion, you know. And this project was just something that I never thought that would change my life like this, you know. I even catch myself looking at this project every other day. And you never know like how your art can affect you. Of course, sometimes people use their photography to be like, oh, look, I've done this, I've done that. But what have you done for yourself? You know, you've helped yourself in so many ways. This is what's simply my way of coping. Of course, I had other things like dance, makeup and nails. But when you're feeling something, you can express it through photography. It doesn't even have to be like, you know, a person's face of them crying. It can be anything like I just simply did hands. And you know, the hands can be interpreted in so many ways. Mm -hmm. So my thought to you is to just try something new. Don't be afraid to just express through photography, you know, through anything that you have. It doesn't always have to be someone's face, like I said. So mm -hmm. thank you. <laughs> Gary, <laughs> you know, um, I appreciate you sharing that. And that is the first time, just so you all know, it's a huge moment because that's the first time Gary's been able to fully describe what's been going on. Um, Gary's always been a very, um, you know, private person and doesn't say a whole lot. And even when she was going through the grieving process here last year, she was in my class like almost every day and she put on a strong front and she got done what she had to get, you know, check off the boxes. I'm doing my work. Everyone would say, Gary, are you doing OK? And she'd go, yeah, I'm OK. Everyone knows you couldn't possibly be OK. And um, I am so proud of you for not being afraid to do this project and for it's you know like you said it, it's more about what it's doing for you and I want you all to really hear what Gary said it was really important because we're all different photographers we have this whole range in this panel here of ones who want to capture other people and memories someone who wants to capture important moments and connection and then someone who who needed that photo for herself and might not have realized it at that time and um I love the fact that you look at it frequently and use it as a way and you have come so far and you should be really proud of yourself and I just I thank you for the special moment that you have allowed all of us to be a part of and that you're able to talk about it so um thank you so much <laughs> I'm sorry I'm so sappy with my students if you ask if anyone that's here on the zoom asks all three y'all tell everybody how much of a sap pitch horn is I I deeply connect with my students and I become very close to them and and their story is my story and um so um I'm so glad you guys all got to be a part of all of that and on that note I'm wondering if anyone has any questions for Gary about this process either by I have a question uh, Gary I know that you had called the image letting go before but is there a new name for it or are you just going to keep it yes when I had um entered it into our um it was the Solano's um art show the mm -hmm. black and white um I had actually called it goodbye because I was saying goodbye to my partner and you know it was a form of letting go, but I just feel like saying goodbye was something that you have to officially let go of. So, yeah. 
That's really good. Thank you, Gary. Anyone else? Uh, I think I, Hassan says, thank you for sharing your story. And I think I can echo that from everybody. That was extremely impactful. And all three of you young women are absolutely amazing in your art and your ability to share and speak in front of a gr group that you don't know. So I really want to thank you for that. Yeah, I kind of like them. <laughs> they're um, they're very well spoken, um, and they've got so much beautiful talent and such great hearts to share. And I'm like I said, I'm so thankful that they're willing to do this because this doesn't happen every day, and I I understand that. Um, so thank you all. So on that note, um, I'm hoping this next part of the session um, where I get it's more. You know, I wanted to pull you in with all the connection and the and the inspiration, but now it's going to be more about technical things and about how to keep yourself inspired and kind of where to start. Because if you've never done photography, um, you know, it can be really overwhelming. So if we start simple and learn some of the basics just in this next time period, then we can kind of just grow from there. And we only have 30 minutes, so we're going to share this um, slideshow um with anyone who's on here so that way you can go back and refer to some of the technical tips um because i i've got to gauge my and if everyone can keep me on top of my time i've got to gauge my speed i throw a lot at you i can never have enough time with you i could be on the zoom for five hours but i mean who knows maybe in the future there'll be more SCOE art workshops and we can do a regular photo series with new themes each time or something and i didn't know i'd be here i started off uh with some video students last year in last November, they um, my video club got a grant from SCOE to go to camp together. We went to camp in the freezing cold at Fly Park and it was so much fun. And um, and we did a bunch of workshops with a lot of other high school students from Solano County who were there for either art purposes or um, multiple purposes, but for the main reason of um, you know the positive impact of finding art as a way to you know um cope with a lot of things and um to not get into you know when when we have these empty sadnesses inside of us or these empty i call them like it's like a pitcher with a crack in the bottom where we can never get filled with enough and we're empty inside and and sometimes we we have a choice whether to fill that imp, that that disappearing pitcher of water with negative things like um drugs which can lead to really really bad roads in life or smoking or you know other illicit behaviors that don't add to our soul they don't add to our spirit they don't they don't heal that emptiness whereas something like an art that you can fill yourself constantly back up with and it only makes you better and stronger and kind of heals that that crack where the everything kind of leaks out um i think that that's that's my goal is to make sure everyone knows they have the potential to reach for something when they're hurting that just fills them up permanently instead of doing more damage um so yeah and definitely film and theater do complement each other so well i mean so so well they go hand in hand um in fact we have a, a the pre, the co-president of my fashion design club was all theater and um, he is now deciding to pursue visual communications and that's that's really what this is you guys so I hope we're all back and I'm not talking to just a few people like but I think we I hope we have everybody but um, whether it's graphic design or photography or theater or even makeup is expressive. That's a visual communication. I think you'll all agree because I've got I've got four different personality types. Shannon's design, Aslan's theater, Arcadia is photography, and then we have a dancer and makeup artist that you can say through those mediums so much without a word, right? A photograph can tell a story with no words in it. So can somebody on stage, so can a dancer, and so can design. You, if you do your art well, it is a visual communication. And so that's that every one of us is connected no matter what our medium of choice is. Um, but photography definitely adds to your body, like your tool set, I would say. It's a tool that you can go to. And um, it's like Shannon was saying, a skill that if you go off to any design skill, uh, any part of design school, having photography, they make you, when I, when I majored in grad and, 
I don't want to see this ugly mess. You don't you dare judge me from my desktop. There we go. <laughs> I haven't cleaned it up in a while. And, and everyone who's been my student knows I used to stand behind them and go, clean up your desktop now. It's a mess. Um, so shh, don't tell anybody mine's messy. Um, so we're done with our break time and let's, let's go ahead and move on to more technical things. So in this slide you're seeing an image by Ansel Adams and if you if you haven't followed photography before Ansel Adams is one of the most prolific um, film photographers so this was taken in uh, it should say the Sierra Nevada not Sarah <laughs> um, in the 1940s he was a film photographer and he was known for his dramatic landscapes and he especially loved taking photos of like Yosemite um, and and other places in California but um, you know he I don't connect as much with landscape photography, although I will never be, I'm not judging it. I will never be as talented as this man. This was all film one and two, like the, the skill set it took to capture what he's captured is amazing. It was so prolific and new for its time. But one of the things that did connect me to Ansel Adams was this quote. Um, the single most important component of a camera is the 12 inches behind it. And that resonated with me because that doesn't mean like, for instance, when you're holding a camera, let me grab one really quick so I can show you guys. When you're holding your camera, it doesn't matter if you're holding a $2,000 camera or if you're holding a phone with a camera on it. The single most component is this 12 inches right here from your forehead to the back of your uh, skull. What's inside this? is the most important component of the camera because I could give anybody on the street a $5,000 camera, but if you don't tap into inside here and how to use whatever camera, if it's, if it's in a phone or if it's professional equipment, without having the knowledge in here, you're not gonna make a great image. You're gonna do what's called a snapshot, which is the bane of all photographers' existence. We need to move beyond a snapshot and use anything to take a photograph. That's what we're going for. And also it's the personal stories inside here that no one else has. No one sees the world like you do. No one feels the things that you do. No one can possibly capture what you're gonna capture. And so that's why this right here is the most important thing, your mind, all right? So we're talking about, um, you know, teaching has been a challenge for me in COVID because usually the students come in and I teach them how to use DSLRs and I have professional lights and professional light boxes and, and Photoshop. And this year it's been none of that. And I'm like, how can I authentically teach photography, you know, being a big whiny baby? And I'm like, no, you know what? Ansel Adams said, it's right here. So we're doing it. So what do you need? If you don't need a $5,000 camera, what do you need? There's two things that I'm gonna encourage you guys to do. Find inspiration, and it can come from many places. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, but technique. Now, there's three main techniques you need to master. One is something called the elements and principles of art and design. Two, technical knowledge of your camera. Now, we don't have DSLRs with us right now, um, and a lot of us don't even have access to those. So we're not gonna talk about that today, and a true understanding of lighting that's something we we definitely don't have time to dip into today but right there if you ask the three um students of mine on this panel how how helpful were the elements and principles in driving your photography to a next level like everything <laughs> yeah thank you shannon it's it literally is everything it connects um whether it's painting or graphic design or photography, these elements and principles are the rules. And again, the slideshow is going to be for you to take with you to look back on because they're two totally different things and we're gonna whip through them really fast to watch our time, but you have to understand them and it will take your photography to a different level. So let's go. Um, places to find. So I said you needed inspo and you needed some technique and you're like, where do I find inspiration? So we're gonna do a quick run through of categories because sometimes categories can like, like tick off little, oh, 
I would like to do that. And then challenges. This is my favorite. This worked really well for COVID photography class for me this year. I gave students a whole month of daily challenges that they had to post either in their drive or on Instagram. Um, and we'll talk more about that later, but having someone tell you what you have to photograph, you would think, oh, I don't want to be told what to do. I'm an artist. You can't tell me what to do. No. Sometimes we need someone to say, take a picture of what playful or play looks like to you. Well, to you or you or you, it might be a different thing. And so it, it, it teaches you, how am I going to represent play? And it really, I love photo challenges. So let's go. So some of the categories you can only imagine are there's four main groups, all right? Nature, people, architecture, and creative. In nature, there's landscapes, flowers, um, you know, fauna, which means the, you know, the trees, the green stuff, animals, and ephemeral, which means temporary um, nature art, um, things that come and go um, depending on the weather. Um, that might not connect with you. I do take nature photographs, but it's not my favorite thing to do. So what I was going to do, but I don't know if we have the capability in here, Joe. Um, and I don't know if we have time anymore. Originally, I was going to ask students if they had examples of work that they've done, if they like were to plot. I made the slideshow, what do you call it? Um, but I forgot to have you share the link with everybody to where they could plop in their own images and their own examples. Um, but I can anyway, set that up real quick if you'd like. Can you? Do we? But how, uh, do we have enough time? And do we have enough people who have images on their computer that they can throw in onto the slideshow really quick? Mm. Does anyone want to try? Yeah. Do we you have to have a part two? Maybe we should have a have a part two right. workshop. <laughs> okay, well, well, then what I'll do is I'll leave it since they're going to have access to the slideshow, you know, they can come in later and add stuff because I'm going to throw them a challenge where I'm offering all through April a chance to give them feedback on their images. So let's talk about that later. And if we have time, we'll come back to the example slides. But on the left, you'll see for me, I've been lately into photographing mushrooms. I never knew how fun it was to find mushrooms. And so hiking up in, um, you know, up in Marin County, you can find them everywhere. And so that's been my thing lately. Um, in people, there's portraiture, which as you saw, Shannon connects with really well, street, fashion, and conceptual, like uh, the Emotions Project. There's a lot of conceptual work in there. So you can, you don't have to necessarily make pretty pictures of people. Uh, you can do lifestyle shots. You can do photojournalism. You can come up with ideas like, how do I use people to express, you know, this emotion or this con? concept. Um, so here's an example of my portraiture. This is actually my nephew, Devin, um, and um, he what needed some photos for his portfolio. So we went crazy and took a bunch of them. And I love doing different portraits, not just the pretty like posts, like school ones, but I like to push the boundaries of light and darkness, obviously. Um, architecture, modern, historical, editorial, like lifestyle, like a perfect little room, you know, set up um, and detail shots, a doorknob that's old and rusty, a window that you don't know what's on the other side. Like I, I like the big, I like to photograph emotional. I'm not a technical photographer. I'm an emotional photographer. I like to make somebody feel something when they look at my images. Um, so here I'm in downtown Sac and I just loved the way that these old buildings in old sack looked against that stormy sky and I just had to get it. Um, and then creatively, like, you know, again, conceptual, like not of people, but of objects, uh, collage. How do you put together a bunch of different images in a, in a collage or surreal? How do you make things look otherworldly? Like they're not, they're not really real. Um, and, and it goes on and on and on. It's really photography can be for you, whatever you want it to be. You can use any equipment. You can use any program. Um, Honestly, here's an example of um, my emotions project. I always jump in on the projects with the students so that way they feel that I'm not just dictating, you have to do this. Like I'm, I'm along for the ride and don't think it's not sometimes hard for me when I'm trying to prepare my classes and I'm running my life and I've got this and that and I'm like, oh, photo every single day to share with the students that I've taken on my own prompts. But I do it because I want, I need the practice too. And so this was a conceptual shot for me of um, the emotion I'm hiding under a table on the floor. So um, I'll let you take from it what you will. Um, 
And then the other part of it was technique. We, we said the two things you need is inspiration, a reason to photograph something and technique. And so you're asking, well, how do I do this? So we're going to learn the elements of art and principles of design, um, interchangeable, like as far as the word art and design, but elements is one thing. Principles is another. All right. So this is so important. You guys, this is so important. Listen up. Elements are like the cooking ingredients to make a dish. So let's say you're about to bake a cake and I tell you to mix the eggs in with the milk, but if you don't have the ingredients of the eggs and milk, you can't mix. So the elements are the ingredients for the cake and the principles are how you put those ingredients together to bake it. Do you get it? Elements are the ingredients and the principles are what you do with the ingredients. So now that we know that, we're gonna look and see what those look like with examples. So the elements, again, the ingredients of photography would be color, notice you, value, texture, shape, and form, line and space. And the principles are unity, balance, emphasis, repetition, contrast, rhythm, alignment, and pattern. How You wanna know how you can remember this? My three students that are here right now. How will you never forget the principles? Uber crap. Uber crap. <laughs> so if you read, if you love acronyms, I don't know about you guys, but I need an acronym in which to remember like a lot of things in my life. So if you read down the list of principles, which again is the, is the way we use the ingredients, it reads uber crap. And that will help you remember unity, balance, emphasis, repetition. All right. Let's see what that looks like. So, oh, I can't forget, this is so important. And this is why you need the slideshow. There's so much to learn. I could do like a million of these workshops with you guys. So in photography specifically, we use things called rule of thirds, fill the frame, framing, focal point or depth of field, worm's eye view, bird's eye view, and abstraction. And I'm gonna show you examples. So um, I'm not gonna read off the slides verbatim, but you can see that color can be um, very impactful. You can either use single pops of it or you can use it to create a vibrant rhythm in your whole image. But either way, color is very, very important because color is what draws our eyes. We This is why you never see a food advertisement in black and white because the human psyche, we want to see color. We're not going to drool over a hamburger on a sign. Billboards never for Burger King or wherever we are never in black and white. Why? Because color speaks to us psychologically. Red excites. Orange and yellow makes you hungry. Blue and green calm you down. Color is super important to think about in your photos. Okay, another element, which is an ingredient, is value. And so value is the range of a color from its lightest, like red would be pink at its lightest, and at its darkest, it would be burgundy. But when we're talking about photography, value is usually black and white, all right? This is very important. I hear students talk about value and they're talking about different colors. I'm like, mm, we're talking about the range of white to black in a photo and all the grays in between. I tell my students, all three of them can tell you, if I didn't see the crispiest white and the sharpest black and all the grays in between, I'd be like, ah, it's gray, it's mush. Show me some value punch. I wanna see the white and the grays and the black. I want it all together in that photo. Texture, now texture and art is amazing because in a painting, haptic textures, you can touch it with your hands. Like, have you ever seen a painting that has like the smeared paint and it's all bubbly up? Well, in photography, optic is visual texture, but it looks so real, you feel like you could touch it just looking at the photo. So looking at that brick wall or a photo of grass or even that metal bar, I almost feel with the rusty edge right here that I could almost feel that in my mind, in my fingertips. Using texture and photography will help somebody like feel like you can almost feel it, right? It, it, it really connects you to the photograph, especially when you mix up a bunch of different textures. Um, shape and form. So we know shape is two dimensional like the circles in the slide. It's flat, it's on paper, shape is just flat. So a circle is a shape, but a form is three dimensional, it has volume. So in photography, we use the word form, like this form of this plant or with the plant. All right, so this is an ingredient. When you, when you have ingredients in photography, you think about what forms are you taking pictures of and how will they look the best, all right? We usually use the word form. Line, so important, you guys. So 
There's two types of line. There's actual line and there's implied line. An actual line is like this top one. It's a line that that runs somewhere through your photo that is actually real. That yellow line on the road, don't tell anybody I was laying on the road in the rain to get this shot. Shh. Fitch one does whatever it takes to get the shot. But it was during COVID, it was on lockdown. I was going crazy in my house. I took a drive in the middle of nowhere. There was nobody. All right, I was totally safe, I promise. Um, and then implied line is like down here. Now these, these little, rivets where a truck drove in the wet country road those aren't real lines they're probably going to grow back with grass soon but the implied line is your it could be a row of trees or it can even be the horizon line the horizon line is not a real line it's just where the sky meets the land but implied either way whether it's a real line or an implied line they guide the viewer's eyes. So you have to decide as a photographer, how am I gonna use that line? Do I want the, the viewers to go from left to right, like the yellow line? Do I want them to go across horizontally? Line is powerful, it leads the eye. Space, space is an ingredient, it's an element. You either have positive space or negative space. Now this one's easier to analyze because it's one object with white space. It's a bird, the positive space, in a white in a white box, negative space. But in photographs, you can think of, if you saw me in my room, I'm the positive space, and my room behind me is the negative space, all right? Now that we're going into principles, right? So we talked about the elements being the ingredients, like color and line and texture and space and form. Those are like all the things we need in the photograph to cook the recipe, right? To make the recipe. But how are we gonna use those things to make the, the end product? So the principles are the how. So unity is so hard, you guys. I always tell my students every year, unity is just how everything feels like it's come together. The shape, the color, the lines, the form, everything. And so this photograph, when you know it, when you see it, it feels unified. There's good shape, there's good lighting, there's, there's, there's you know, everything's just working right. The line of the windowsill is making me look, look, your eye goes in, goes around the rim and continually goes out the window. It's it's how you manipulate, depending on how where the cup is turned, the window being cracked instead of closed, all those little details make your eye, you can manipulate your audience to see what you want them to see and how they look through a photo. Balance, balance is easy, you guys. It's either symmetrical. If I took a line down the middle of this photo and I were to fold this photo in, in, in half like this, it would be symmetrical because it is exactly the same on either side of an axis. Now, asymmetrical, which I didn't put an example in, I'm so sorry, is when it's not a mirror image, but it's the visual weight feels right, okay? Um, so there's two kinds of balance. Emphasis, it's where you choose as the photographer where you're gonna lead the viewer's eye. All right, and this can be achieved like I did, where you use color that stands out. This is the only orange flower. That's the emphasis. Your eye can't help but look at that poppy. But you can also put it to the front of the foreground, which I also did. And you can make sure the focal point is where you want it to be on the foreground um, or through framing, which we'll learn about later. Okay, framing can help direct the eye and create emphasis, but we'll learn about that in a second. Repetition is exactly as it sounds. If you find a repetitive motif or a form or a color, it creates visual rhythm and it takes something ordinary like vitamin water and turns it into artwork, okay? You normally, if you just took a picture of vitamin water on a table, you'd be like, oh, okay. But by taking a picture of it lined up at an angle with the light pinging off of the bottom, Model, you create this like visual interest, right? So repetition creates visual interest. Contrast, it's the extreme of opposites. White on white, white shoes on a black background, or it could be um, an orange flower against a blue sky, or it could be a red rose in the middle of white roses. But contrast, you need contrast. If you've got all brown, like a brown mushroom in brown tan bark against a brown tree, no contrast, no interest. Bah, boring. You want you want to make that eye pop, okay? 
rhythm. Now, rhythm is created when you have so, a lot of visual activity going on, and it could be like in this case, the colors. There's so much line and color overlapping each other. Your eye doesn't stop, right? Like there is no emphasis here. Rhythm is when your eye does not stop. It just goes constantly over and over and over through a photo. So this photo definitely has rhythm. It your eye is moving nonstop. Okay, and alignment. I used four different images because alignment is usually reserved for graphic design. It's like the backbone of graphic design. But listen, guys, in alignment, how I relate it to photography is how are you going to align your body? Like just taking two steps to the left gives you a totally different photograph or aligning your camera. I could have taken a picture of this bridge like just from the side, maybe it wouldn't have been as interesting, but when I align myself against this railing, my eye gets led back there, right? The diagonal. Instead of just taking a picture of this DJ mixing board, just like front on or on top of it, which still would have been cool on top of it, the diagonal, it gives you like this, like unique alignment, right? The even juxtaposing objects, look at how I've got the shoes tipped and my little earbuds tipped, right? And I laid on the ground, I aligned myself on the ground, I moved my body, instead of just taking a picture like this of shoes just flip-flopped anywhere and earbuds like that, that would not be a composition. But by making sure they're aligned with this visual interest and putting myself on the ground, moving, my, aligning my body in a different position than I normally would, this gives us a whole different look. And then again, the Ferris wheel by making sure I could have stood in front of it and just had a circle like this. And that would have been a great photo, but by putting myself so the trees create this frame around it and I align myself diagonally, it feels almost kind of like creepy instead of a super fun, like dun, 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 all of a sudden like, Ooh, like it's kind of like moody now. Like, so you should always ask like, how can I align myself or the, or the subject in a way that's totally different? All right. That's a good thing to ask. Pattern, a repeated motif, like a design or a set of shapes or lines or objects that um, different than repetition in the sense that it's consistently the same. All right. Repetition, like if you have a bunch of trees in your photo, trees might be different sizes and heights and stuff, but a pattern is usually a very consistent repetition. So you can see the pattern in the ceiling at the British Museum in London um, really intrigued me. And it leads your eye. Look at what it does too. It like leads your eye. The pattern just, you don't know, you're like coming from here out. So pattern can be used to you know, force the viewer also to look at certain things. Um, now we have those weird photography things that really work well and they're little tricks. So the rule of thirds is where you pretend when you're looking through your lens, whether you're going like this with your iPhone or you're looking through your camera lens, you're going to pretend that there's a grid of thirds, both vertically and horizontally. And instead of putting the cow in the middle, I chose to put the cow in the thirds because think of this in your head, try to imagine just the picture of a cow in the middle of your gram photo. And then just by shifting myself, so that way I was off to the side and the cow was barely in the frame, all right, I was able to get rule of thirds. And that also goes for the horizon line. Notice that I kept in, I could have taken a picture where the cow was centered just right here, but I made sure that I also had my camera so that the horizon line where the sky meets the land is in the bottom third. Okay, rule of thirds, it's powerful, super powerful for making your images different. Um, fill the frame. These are just normal lampshades hanging from the ceiling of a restaurant I went to, but the texture fascinated me. So I, I zoomed in as close as possible because when you fill the frame and there's no distractions behind it, it becomes so much more interesting. Get those distractions out. Don't see the stuff in the background. Let your viewer completely enjoy what it is that you're enjoying about that moment or that texture or that color or whatever it is that fascinates you about that. Here we are, framing. Remember I told you to create emphasis? You can do um, things like 
have a different color, like a red rose and a white, a, a field of white roses. Well, framing is really good for drawing emphasis to something on the other side. So I was taking a, white, a walk along the Benicia waterfront and framing should not be confused with fill the frame. Fill the frame is where you fill the like the frame with the object, no distractions. But framing is where you use things like windows or branches of trees or um, a keyhole. Or in this case, it was the way the tree, the um, what's that called? Driftwood. It was a giant piece of driftwood had this like hole in it. And when you look through it, I saw this power tower. I was like, Ooh, I really like that. That really like, instead of just taking a picture of the tower, I'm like, Ooh, this will, you know, create that emphasis. And it's visually way more interesting than just a tower. All right. The next part is focal point. What do you want your audience to see first? Focal point is where you choose to focus the camera to draw the most attention. Notice this is blurry and this is the most hyper-focused. So my eye comes to the word love, right? Now it says love conquers all or, you know, love above all or love conquers above or whatever you want to say it. But love was the word I wanted to focus on. So I put it in the foreground and I hyper-focused and let everything else go blurry in the background. So focal point. <laughs> is important for for making the audience see what you want them to look at okay so i got a tickle i'm talking so much warm side view is so fun because it makes you get on the ground <laughs> which i love taking pictures on the ground but it also makes something more if i had just taken a picture of this weed just standing there like walking a pina adobe bah. but by me like actually yes getting in the dirt and like kind of shooting up through it and putting it at a diagonal. Remember, we're talking about how you're aligning the, the subject or your body. All of a sudden, it becomes way more interesting than if you're just like, oh, look, a sharp pokey weed. All of a sudden, I have way more interest. So think about getting on the ground and looking up, pointing your camera, click, click. All right. And then on the opposite bird's eye view, um, I use a lot to do two of my favorite things. I love doing food photography. And I also love um, my flat lay photography where like you assemble an outfit, like all cute, and then you stand over it, you know, like you see blogger style. So bird's eye view is exactly as it sounds where you stand over. Sometimes this is fun for taking pictures like yearbook students I teach all the time, right? Shannon, didn't I, ha didn't I take your guys's photos one year where I was standing on top of like a desk or a shelf or something crazy and I took all of you guys from above was that you I don't think it was I can't okay. remember all right I know at one class they always ask me as a photography teacher you always get asked to take the shots of everything the school needs you to take so they're like can you take a picture of our class for the club shot or whatever it was and I and I got on top of something tall ladders work really well if you bring a baby ladder with you wherever you go in your trunk um then you can like stand above things and it gives you a whole different look right abstraction or abstract photography is one of my favorite i love it when people go what the heck is that what is that and i like it and sometimes it doesn't have to be anything like this is a stairwell in san francisco as you're walking through to chinatown to the best dim sum in chinatown you have to walk through that tunnel in san francisco with the yellow and the koi and the light was hitting right there just right and i had to get that moment I, for me i don't care if anyone else likes this photo I like this photo and I like this moment. And that's what photography can be too. It's just like, I want to remember this and I like it and I don't care what anyone thinks. It can be whatever you want it to be in abstraction. It's like where you take something that you don't quite know what's going on or what's happening, but it, it makes you feel a certain way, right? Now, the other part of, like I said, Photography is not just about inspiration, but it's about practice. And we talked about knowing the principles and elements, right? The elements are the ingredients. The principles are how you mix the ingredients up and how you use them. But also I talked about like a discipline, like having a challenge, like how do I get in practice of seeing the world in a new way and capturing it in a totally new way? So I've provided for you guys uniquely to this class. I might have to snatch it up for my next quasi-master's photo students too. 
but this is an April photo a day challenge and all of this, everything I'm talking about pretty much is in the speaker notes. When you get this presentation, if you look in the speaker notes, tons of what I'm talking about is in the speaker notes. But um, this one is all based on international holidays ranging from Ramadan to like, for instance, there's actually a thing called National 8-Track Tape Day, which if you didn't grow up in the 70s, you don't know what an 8-Track Tape is, but they were pretty awesome. Um, but what's great is I decided to take them and then find a way to connect to that that you can interpret how you want like for instance if you look on april 1st i'm taking a photo that represents honor or culture it either i mean excuse me it either represents or honors a different culture which is super important to not you know um be like you're mocking a culture or you're taking culture but how do i take a photograph and what does culture mean to me um you know number three is rainbow or color like if you can't find a rainbow to photograph which is hard like any color that inspires you so all of these prompts are only meant to be takeoff points for some sort of inspiration and if you want feedback, what I'm offering up is anybody that's at the workshop. Um, this Misfit Tron account is private, so nobody but students are on it. Um, and I use it in all my photo classes. I just really started to during especially COVID. Um, so because I can't give feedback on your computers walking around the classroom, I was like, well, you can either put it in Drive in a special folder where I can see it and give you feedback, or you can just tag me in your Insta photos and you can, um, I'll direct message you and give you feedback on like, yeah, this works so well. Why don't you try this angle or try it in black and white or do this. Um, it works super well for my students. Um, I've got a good handful of at least six out of 16 in my second period photo class this quasi-master like are religious, they post before I do. Like I can't even like, I, sometimes I skip a couple days and I'll post three at once, um, but they'll be like on top of it and like giving feedback and, and everything and liking it and putting little googly eyed, hard eyed little emojis on it. Um, it just really helps to have feedback. And I give students extra credit in my classrooms for liking each other's stuff and giving authentic, like, you know, not just for the extra credit, oh, I'll heart this, but sane, positive, things about it so that we, it, it just feels really good to have a community of artists that support you and applaud what you do. So this is my offer to you, take it or leave it at will. But also if you have this slideshow and you click on this, I don't know if you can do it when you're on school Wi-Fi, obviously, because things are blocked, but I made the image clickable. So it takes you right to um, my site where you can see these are all have been prompts of the day. This These were my prompts for, um, when was this February? It was De that was December's was all these down here. These must be February's. Anyways, so that's an offer to you. Don't have to take me up on it, but it's out there. And then just finally, why? Why do I need a, an art form? Why do I need photography? Um, one, to find your voice. As you heard from the three stories of these students, they all found different ways to use photography to find their voice. Um, for Shannon, there's a lot of reasons that are different than Gary's, that are different than Arcadia's, but um, super powerful. And to heal yourself. Like sometimes it's amazing how, like in Gary's circumstance, like she said, she could not communicate what she was going through and emotions are hard for her to talk about. And so she found herself using photography to heal that and it's taken time and she's still in the process of that because it's not something you get over overnight, but that she uses that moment and that photo to heal herself and to be able to let go. Now on that note, here's some statistics about what happens when you don't have something to when you're sad or you need to connect or when you you know want to make relationship for whatever reason you find an art form you know in this case we're talking about photography here's some statistics about the relationship between depression and um, addiction to alcohol and drugs if we can't find something when we're going through it and teenagers always go through it in different ways, whether they're showing it or not. I remember I told you my story. I went through it. 
we have choices of roads to go down when we are going through it. And if unfortunately you choose the wrong thing, you can go down a rabbit hole where there's no coming out of. Addiction is a horrifying thing. Whereas if you find something else to cope with, whether it's dancing or painting or photography, it it literally can be the life thread that keeps you from going down the wrong, wrong road. All right, so here's some statistics and even more because of the fact that I've suffered through depression and in high school, um, I did attempt suicide and I was a cutter. And if I had been successful in what my misery wouldn't allow me to see in my depression, when all I could think about was that I just didn't want to be around anymore. If I had have succeeded, if I hadn't have had not only my art, but friends who loved me and connected to me through my art, I don't know if I would have made it to the other side. And if I hadn't have been successful, I wouldn't have been able to travel all the places I have. I wouldn't have been able to have three beautiful daughters who are some of my best friends. I wouldn't be able to connect with my students like the ones you hear here that make my day that I am able to help them through their stuff. I wouldn't be able to teach my it's my thing. It was what I was born to do. And I just feel really strongly. Um, suicide is the leading cause of death. Um, the tenth leading cause of death of population in the entire overall population. That's adults, children, kids. Second leading cause of death in young people between 10 and 24. And one out of eight children, the ages through six through 12, have suicidal thoughts. And on that note, we don't talk about this enough. Um, there's a lot of stigma. And I think a lot of adults and teachers especially are afraid to bring it up and talk about it. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm here to tell you, you can make it to the other side and because there's some beautiful things waiting for you in the next leg of your journey. Um, this thing we call um, being a student doesn't last forever. And uh, it's amazing. Um, Arcadia can tell you on the other side because now she's officially old lady 22 and um, making it through the other side to some things feels really darn good. And uh, if you do have any friends, if you yourself have never suffered um, depression, um, here are some warning signs and some risk factors of depression to be on the lookout for. Because like Gary was saying, you would never really know on the outside maybe. Sometimes people are really good at hiding what they're going through. And so we have to be really hyper aware of, of some things because it's sometimes really super, super tricky when, when, you know, when they're not showing any of these things, but if somebody is showing one of these warning signs, or if they have any of these risk factors in their life, being aware of what these are is super important because you can be the person who inspires. You can be the person who encourages. You can be like me on the other side of surviving a really, really hard teenage year and tell somebody I've been there. You can do that. I'm here for you. This is how we're going to get through this together. Here are some phone numbers for the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, as well as the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration. Um, both of them can give you resources and help, or you can refer somebody to this number if you need to. And then on that note, I hope I didn't take too long. I haven't been watching the time at all because I love to teach and I love to talk. Um, I just want to thank every Everybody here, students, panelists that I've invited and um, the SCOE um, team for, for being present and, and for being brave and strong and trying new things and just, just for being you. So thank you.